Sonic Unleashed released in 2008 for the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, Nintendo Wii, and PlayStation 2. It was a major turning point in the series when the formula was drastically changed after the damage that Sonic 06 wrought upon the franchise. When the game initially launched, its critical reception was largely poor, with critics lamenting the slow, sluggish Werehog stages while praising the high-octane boost stages. Over the years, though, Sonic Unleashed has developed a sort of cult following, with some fans even claiming that it's the best game in the entire series. So what do I think? Well, spoiler alert, it's complicated. Before we begin, though, I need to get a few things straight. Firstly, I will not be reviewing the Wii or PS2 versions in this video. This is strictly about the quote-unquote HD version for the Xbox 360 and PS3. Someday down the line I may cover the SD version, but I'm omitting it for this video due to it being so different and not nearly as impactful on the series as a whole. Secondly, I would apologize for the footage quality, but I won't. Why, you may ask? Well, because Microsoft sucks. Or Sega does. I don't know who exactly to blame, but what I do know is that Sonic Unleashed does not have a resolution boost on the Xbox Series X. I don't know why, but it doesn't. I received some comments on my previous video claiming that you can play it in 4K, but I couldn't find anything online to back that up, and my console doesn't give me any option to do so, either because it really doesn't exist, or because I haven't sold my soul just to afford a 4K monitor. Either way, the footage in this video is at the original 720p resolution of the Xbox 360 60 version, with the 60fps boost provided by the Series X. I'd say I'm sorry, but I'm not, because quite frankly, it's not my fault that these companies refuse to provide a good way to play their games at a decent resolution. Alright? Okay. And finally, because I know someone is going to comment about this if I don't mention it, yes, I tried using Xenia, but the game kept doing this, so I opted to go the Series X route. Again, not my fault, so I'm not apologizing deal with it. Now, with all that out of the way, this is my review of Sonic Unleashed. Our story begins on the Egg Carrier, where Dr. Eggman is about to break the planet apart with a giant laser. Sonic arrives, turning super and destroying his fleet, but not before Eggman captures him and drains the Chaos Emeralds of their energy. Eggman fires the laser, releasing an ancient entity, Dark Gaia, which turns Sonic into a hairy monster called the Werehog in the process. He's sent plummeting back down to Earth, where he meets a small creature named Chip, who has amnesia because Sonic fell on top of him. Great job, buddy. Together, they set out to restore Chip's memory, stop Eggman, and hopefully repair the planet in the process. If this plot feels familiar, that's probably because it's largely the same concept as in Adventure in 06. Eggman awakens a long, dormant god of destruction, and Sonic and friends have to stop it. I suppose you could call it tried and true, but I have to admit the concept was starting to wear a little thin by this point. Sonic Unleashed takes on a much lighter tone than its predecessors, with a heavier emphasis on both verbal and slapstick humor. For the most part, I think this works quite well for the game. While later entries would take this to its logical extreme by forcing a dad joke out of Sonic's mouth every five seconds, Unleashed balances its corny humor with some genuine heart and manages a story that I can mostly get behind. With this said though, I do have one issue with it. Unleashed sidelines a majority of Sonic's established supporting cast, which applies to other areas of the game as well, but I'll get to that later. Right now I want to talk about Tails, because his character seems to have been altered in order to keep him from getting too involved. His only role in the game is to get Sonic from point A to point B in his plane, and sometimes provide intel. While previous games continued his development established in Sonic Adventure, Tails in Unleashed is notably more cowardly. Early on in the game, Sonic is required to save him from Dark Gaia's minions, even though the old Tails wouldn't need any help in this situation. While it doesn't outright ruin the narrative in this case, this characterization would carry over into future games as well, so I feel it's worth mentioning here. Despite my criticisms though, there is plenty of good here as well. I love the way Sonic is portrayed in this game. Even though the cards he's been dealt aren't exactly favorable, he's always giving his all and encouraging Chip to do the same, all while keeping his confident, snarky attitude. This is a really solid rendition of the character, and it's refreshing to see in retrospect compared to how he would be written in later games. And speaking of good characterization, they also nailed Eggman this time around. Granted, he's rarely had any bad portrayals, but it's nice to see him acting like the goofy, egg-shaped mad scientist he is after the boring, vaguely sinister rendition of him we got in 06. He may be a scientific genius, but a wise man he is not. Even his own robots argue with him in this game, and 
it's hilarious every time. Finally, there's a twist later on in the game where, when Chip finally gets his memory back, it's revealed that he's actually Light Gaia, the entity that's supposed to seal Dark Gaia every few million years. I'll admit it's a bit of a weird twist, but I kind of like it. It shows that even a small, goofy little thing like Chip can hold great power, and I think that's pretty cool. Overall, while I may have my gripes with the story in Unleashed, I'd easily say this is a major improvement from the overly complex and serious plot of 06 and the barely there plot of Heroes. This is more in line with how I feel Sonic stories should be treated. Lighthearted, but with heart nonetheless. This brings us to the cutscenes, along with the presentation as a whole. The game cold opens with one of the most universally praised cutscenes in the entire series, and that goes a long way in making a great first impression. These CGI cinematics are a major highlight when it comes to the visuals of Sonic Unleashed. However, the in-game aesthetics also stand out and are a significant improvement over Sonic 06. This is due to the culmination of a variety of advancements that Sonic Team made in the years leading up to this game's release. See, Sonic Unleashed was the first of many titles to run on the aptly named Hedgehog Engine, a proprietary framework with the goal of making levels look as pretty as possible using a combination of real-time and baked lighting. I won't bore you with all the technical details, but some of the highlights are global illumination, real-time shadows interacting with the pre-baked ones on the environments, and some pretty impressive screen space reflections for 2008. Put simply, this game is downright gorgeous and still holds up thanks to the art direction that coexists with the advanced rendering technology. That said, this did come at a price, that being the game's performance on 7th generation consoles. The Xbox 360 and PS3 versions of Sonic Unleashed have developed kind of a notoriety over the years for their subpar frame rate, rarely reaching their target of 30 FPS. Thankfully I didn't have to deal with that when replaying the game for this review thanks to the Series X, but I thought it was worth mentioning considering that not everyone can even find the darn thing, much less afford it. <coughs> Despite this, Unleashed is easily one of the best looking games in the series, and if this game ever receives a PC port, I think the effort that Sonic Team put into the graphics all those years ago will finally pay off when we can play it in glorious Ultra HD. Fancy lighting aside, Sonic Unleashed also excels at character animation, which you may recall was a bit of a sore spot in prior entries. All the world rejoice, because the awful mocap from Games Past is finally behind us. There's a clear attention to detail that was put into the in-engine cutscenes, and while they don't compare to the absolute cinema that is the CGI FMVs, it's still a heck of an upgrade, and it carries over into the in-game animation as well. This game also sees the Sonic cast redesign design once again, bringing the proportions closer to how they were in Heroes while softening up on the sheen. While I'll certainly miss the Genesis-like shine on Sonic and crew, I do think this design ultimately fits the vibe of Unleashed and some of the future entries. My only major problem with this design, nitpicks aside, is how it looks and still renders. When it's in motion, it looks great, but something about the way these are posed just feels stiff. Well, except for this one. This one's raw. While visuals are an important aspect of presentation, we should also talk about the audio. As is Sonic tradition, Unleashed has a really solid soundtrack, and the various genres it pulls from are always appropriate for the globe-trotting theme of the game. When it comes to the voice acting, I'm a little mixed. To start positive, Jason Griffith has improved drastically as Sonic, giving much more varied inflections than in the previous game. Some people don't seem to enjoy the enthusiastic woo sounds that he makes during gameplay, but personally I think it just adds to the fun. I'm less fond of his voice for the Werehog, though I want to stress that this is clearly not Jason's fault. You can tell that he's straining his throat to deliver every line, and while I respect the hustle, I personally think they should have gotten someone else to voice the Werehog. I understand why they didn't, this is the same character, so you want at least a hint of Sonic's normal voice in there, but this unfortunately just seems to be out of Griffith's range, hindering his ability to comfortably act in the role. Otherwise, I think the voice acting in Unleashed is fine. Mike Pollock kills it once again as Eggman, no surprise there, and I also quite like Professor Pickle's voice, but everyone else I could probably take or leave. Chip kinda started to get grading after a while, and the NPC voice actors were clearly just getting their paycheck. When it's all said and done though, Sonic Unleashed pretty much nails its presentation. The environments are gorgeous, the graphics are above par for 2008, the music slaps, and the voice acting is solid where it matters most. And now comes the part where things get messy. I've been very positive about Sonic Unleashed so far, and there's certainly still some more good things to be said, but I've found that my experience with the actual gameplay was rocky, to say the least. To start, let's go over the general structure of the game. While in previous titles we were blessed with the opportunity to play as several side characters, often seeing their own perspectives on the same story, Sonic Unleashed has stripped things down to just the titular Hedgehog himself, along with his new alter ego, the Werehog. This is the first of many changes made in response to the negative reception of Sonic 06. 
graphics. While the difference between these two playstyles could not be more stark, there are a few common elements that they share that I should mention. Firstly, hub worlds are brought back once again, this time representing every area in the game. This is because, unlike previous games, which were limited to a few main areas leading to stages that may or may not have followed the theme, Sonic Unleashed focuses on making every location feel like its own country, with unique climates, locals, etc. The variety of environments on display here is pretty impressive, and often takes inspiration from real-life locations as well. Unfortunately, there's not much to do in these hub worlds, and in fact these might just be the smallest out of any Sonic game. The main things you'll be doing are searching for levels in the entrance stage area, talking to locals every so often, and hunting down sun and moon medals, which is another thing I should talk about. These medals are found everywhere, from the hub worlds to the action stages, and a certain amount of them are required to progress to the next batch of levels. Despite the globetrotting theme, you're going to find yourself going back and forth between the different countries fairly often, because the order in which you unlock these stages doesn't seem to follow any rhyme or reason. That's not the main issue here, though. The real problem is the sheer amount of these medals you're required to collect. You'll be blasting through levels and bosses, having a grand old time, but then the game will slow to a crawl as you realize that you have to go scrounging around for more of these stupid things before you can continue playing the game. I'll go more in depth about those once we get into the individual playstyles, but there's one more thing to mention, and that's experience points. That's right, this game has experience points, and you'll earn them by defeating enemies in the action stages. These can be used to upgrade Sonic's stats for either his hedgehog or werehog form. Once again, we'll get more into that in due time. For now, it's time we once again recap my three staples of Sonic excellence. For those of you who are new, these are the basic principles that I look for in a character's playstyle in a Sonic game. 1. Essential Sonic staples should be present. These include rings, springs, robotic enemies, etc. 2. Replayability should be incurred through design. A good Sonic gameplay style should have a high skill ceiling for mastering the character's moveset and or challenging levels that become more fun the more you play them. And finally, 3. The character's central attribute should be important. By central attribute, I mean the core of the character's design. For example, Sonic is a hedgehog, so his gameplay should place emphasis on his ability to roll into a ball. Note that these don't necessarily denote a good playstyle period, but rather a baseline that distincts a Sonic game from any other generic platformer. Now, with these in mind, let's get into it. First, we have the day stages, where we play as Sonic the Hedgehog in his normal form. And forget everything you knew about 3D Sonic gameplay, because we're starting over from square one here. See, a few years before Unleashed, a little game called Sonic Rush for the DS was released, which shook up 2D Sonic gameplay by adding the boost meter, which allowed Sonic to instantly reach top speed and barrel through enemies for as long as the meter wasn't empty. Sonic Team must have seen potential for this formula, because now that same boost is here in Sonic Unleashed. How it works is simple, you have a ring energy meter in the bottom left that fills up the more rings you collect. At any time, you can hold the X button to give Sonic a burst of speed, using up that meter. The issue I have with this is that it completely replaces the spin dash and any other rolling moves Sonic may have had in the past. Instead of earning your speed through the environment itself and your own skillful play, as long as you have some juice in the boost tank, you can blast through pretty much any part of the stage. With that said though, the last thing I want to call this gameplay style is easy, because it is most certainly not. The thing about completely changing up an established formula is that your game often suffers from what some fellow YouTubers have dubbed first game syndrome. Basically, since you're starting from scratch, your game will inevitably be outclassed by its sequels. This is very much the case with the day stages in Sonic Unleashed. While the game overall is fairly polished, the design of the levels in Sonic's moveset are anything but. First major issue, the handling. Sonic is way too slippery, and combined with the boost, you'll find yourself flying off the stage quite often. Some levels, such as Windmill Isle and Rooftop Run, are designed with side rails to accommodate this, but many others, such as Empire City and Eggman Land, are not, forcing you to forego the boost and awkwardly jog around curves. The game tries to solve this by introducing another new move, the Drift. This is a nice addition on paper, but once again it's ruined by the level design, which just doesn't feel like it's properly designed for it. Sometimes the arc feels too wide, and other times I end up doing an accidental U-turn. This all is combined with several other miscellaneous issues I have with this playstyle, such as the homing attack now being mapped to X, meaning you can accidentally boost when you're just trying to do an air dash, and these pointless quick time events. It just feels like this moveset needed a lot more testing before moving on to level design. That's not to say everything here is bad though, in fact there's a few things I quite like. While the boost is often an agent of chaos in this game, there are times where it delivers on its promise, 
promise of exhilarating speed in levels such as Cool Edge and Dragon Road, allowing you to run on top of the water's surface. As much as I'll always prefer the momentum-based approach, moments like these showcase the potential that this style has. Unleashed also introduces sections that switch to a 2.5D perspective, essentially turning the level into a 2D platformer for a brief moment. While the 3D platforming is a nightmare due to the slippery controls, the 2D platforming doesn't suffer here nearly as much, which I suppose makes sense given the origins of the boost. With all of this said, how did the day stages in Sonic Unleashed perform under the three staples of Sonic Excellence? As usual, the first requirement is met with flying colors, as the elements we've come to expect such as rings, springs, loop-de-loops, and robotic enemies are all here. Additionally, the second staple I feel is also met for the most part. As much as I'll lament the unrefined controls and level design, this is all stuff that you'll inevitably learn to work around when replaying these levels. While I haven't S-ranked every single stage in the game, I've replayed Windmill Isle and Cool Edge so many times that I've definitely warmed up to them, and I'm sure the same could be said for the majority of the day stages. However, it all falls apart at requirement number three. I will almost certainly get a lot of flack for this, but I want to remind everyone that this guy's name is Sonic the Hedgehog, not Sonic the Fast. While speed has always been a staple of the series, how that speed is earned is equally important, and rolling downhill to gain momentum was the series' standard up until this point. This isn't me calling the boost bad or whatever. As you'll see in the coming months, I actually quite like it in Sonic Colors and Sonic Generations. The point of the three staples was never to judge whether or not a game is strictly good, but rather to hold games within the same series to a reasonable standard. If a Sonic game was a reskin of Elden Ring, but with Sonic as the player model, it would be a great game, but not a good Sonic sequel. And I hate to break it to you, but Sonic Unleashed, for all of its merits, is not a good Sonic sequel. Alright, now that I've signed my death sentence, let's put the final nail in the coffin. I like the night stages. Yeah, I said it. In these stages, you play as Sonic the Werehog, a heavier and hairier version of the Blue Blur with stretchy arms and Herculean strength. He moves much slower, so his levels focus more on combat and puzzle platforming. And when it comes to that puzzle platforming, I think the Werehog pretty much nails it. As weird as the stretchy arms are, they're often used in clever ways, such as grabbing onto high platform ledges, swinging from bars, and climbing up poles. This combined with the double jump makes for a surprisingly agile moveset for what's meant to be the slower character here. There's a certain flow that you'll eventually reach within these stages, moving blocks to use as platforms, grabbing flying enemies to get extra air, scrounging around for hidden collectibles. Come to think of it, it's kind of a similar feeling to the one I get when I have the dungeon formula in a Zelda game all figured out. With all this said, these stages certainly still have their issues. For one thing, they are long. Like, upwards of 20 minutes long. I get that the Werehog is slow, but if anything, I feel like they could have cut down on the length for that very reason. And the biggest culprit of this length is also the biggest issue I have with this playstyle, that being the combat. Well, less so the combat itself, but rather the unnecessary amount of it you're supposed to. These levels rarely have time to breathe in between strenuous platforming sections before you're faced with another enemy gauntlet, and these start to turn into a chore after a while. What doesn't help is the obnoxious music that interrupts the normal level theme, which makes me internally groan every time I hear it. So how does the Werehog perform under the three Sonic staples? Once again, the first requirement is met, no surprise there. When it comes to the second requirement though, I wasn't sure at first. I mean, replaying these long, combat-filled levels? How fun could that possibly be? Well, as it turns out, a lot more fun than the first time through. First of all, if you're being diligent about leveling up your strength attribute, you'll easily clear enemies in previous stages, allowing you to quickly get over the enemy gauntlets and focus on the platforming. Not only that, but going back and searching for remaining sun and moon medals is surprisingly fun in these levels. As you could probably imagine, this sucks in the day stages, seeing as they're built around blasting through in a straight line, and Sonic handles about as well as me in any social situation. Here though, this isn't an issue, and the Werehog's moveset is much better suited for this kind of scavenger hunt. That brings us to the third staple, and the Werehog certainly passes this one. The puzzle platforming takes full advantage of his stretchy arms, and as much as I'm not huge on the combat, it does showcase his strength. Overall, the night stages thoroughly surprised me, and I actually ended up enjoying them more than the normal Sonic levels. Now comes the part where I have to talk about the bosses, which at this point I should probably make another set of staples for, but for now I'll just briefly sum up what I'm looking for. Like I said in the Sonic 06 retrospective, classic Sonic bosses adhere to a simple design philosophy. There's no limit to how many times you can hit the boss while it's vulnerable, only the amount of time that it is. To balance this, they typically had more hit points than your usual platformer enemy, taking around 8 or so hit points to defeat. 3D Sonic has had a hard time adapting this design, if Sonic Team ever even cared 
cared about doing so in the first place. Will Sonic Unleashed be the one to break the cycle? Well, actually, yes. Kind of. Let's start with the day bosses. These take place on a constantly moving track where the player needs to collect rings and boost towards the enemy and perform a homing attack to deal damage, all while avoiding their opponent's attacks. Although every homing attack will send you back a ways, requiring you to start over, there's seldom any time where the boss isn't technically vulnerable, so it still sort of counts. As for the night bosses, these also fit the bill. They typically require some kind of puzzle to be solved, after which the enemy is made vulnerable and the werehog can beat it up for as long as it is. Deal enough damage and the game will often throw you into a quick time event. Yeah, this game really likes these, but they do allow the player to deal more damage and make quicker work of the boss. Out of all games, to finally figure out how to adapt the classic boss philosophy into 3D, Unleashed would have been my last guess, but here we are. However, all this isn't to say that these are perfect. When it comes to the day bosses, these are mostly fine, but there are a few that I had a hard time with. With the night bosses, though, I was rarely having any fun. The puzzles you have to solve are either painfully obvious or way too obtuse, and the quick time events will fail you if you even make one errant button press, even if it's not a button that the game ever asks for, such as the way too sensitive triggers. Still, these are better than average for 3D Sonic bosses, so credit where it's due, I suppose. Spoiler alert, skip here if you don't want to see him. Sonic and Chip have made it to Eggman Land, the final stretch before they can defeat Eggman and Dark Gaia once and for all. Good lord, this level sucks. Look, I know this isn't a hot take or anything, but not only is Eggman Land way too long, it's also poorly designed on top of that. Switching between day and night Sonic is a neat idea, but neither of their parts of the level are any fun. The day sections hardly have any guardrails, so boosting is pretty much suicide, and the night sections have awful camera angles on top of an overabundance of enemy encounters even by this game's standards. But anyway, after that slog of a level, the Werehog defeats Eggman's final mech. The Egg Dragoon and Chip gathers the Chaos Emerald Temples together to build a mech of his own to help defeat Dark Gaia, leading to the final boss. And I'm sorry, but this boss also sucks. Basically, you have to slowly fly across a long stretch as Devastator over here, being careful to either dodge, block, or punch these oncoming meteors, and do a quick time event to hold Dark Gaia off. Once that's done, you play a short section as Day Sonic, do another quick time event, and rinse and repeat this whole thing three times. And sure, three times may not seem that bad, but that's only assuming you're not like me and keep dying to the awful hitboxes on these meteors, or to the abhorrent level design and sonic sections. In total, I probably ended up doing this song and dance more like seven times before I finally got through it all, and it was a chore. Thankfully, the second phase isn't nearly as frustrating. As is series tradition by this point, you play as Super Sonic here and have to defeat these snake things to destroy Dark Gaia's shield. After that, the game really relishes in a final quick time event, and our job is finally over. The game ends with Dark Gaia being sealed back into the Earth, Chip bringing Sonic to safety and leaving a small memento to remember him by, the residents of every country we visited celebrating our victory, and finally, the credits. Sonic Unleashed is not a bad game, but I'd also hesitate to call it a good game. There's plenty to love here, of course. The story and cutscenes are charming, the environments are beautiful, and even the much-debated Werehog shines through its puzzle platforming. But by the end of it, I couldn't help but think more about the things I didn't love. Quick time events rearing their ugly head, obnoxious combat that overstayed its welcome, and of course the complete departure from the iconic Sonic formula. More than ever, I can understand why Unleashed is so divisive. For every awful design decision it makes, it also does something brilliant. For every death from the slippery controls, there's a breathtaking boost sequence. For every annoying enemy encounter, there's a fun puzzle in between. And for every awful quick time sequence, there's an endearing cutscene that shows a genuine passion from Sonic Team to make an experience that, if nothing else, is memorable. And while I won't say that Sonic Unleashed is a good Sonic game, it certainly is, if nothing else, memorable. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe because I've got videos coming soon about this game, Sonic Colors, and much more. You can also become a member for just a dollar per month to unlock exclusive emojis and join the Spotland Discord server. But either way, stay tuned, thanks for watching, and as always, enjoy life.